SB 42.10. Anicca Sita Sutta on page 53. This Sutta, is, this Sutta is also very short, but the commentary is very long. There's a lot of psychology here. And this is where I'll be talking, telling a bit more uh, about the five aggregates. Okay? Okay, look at page 53, top right hand corner, this is how we start, okay, this is the, the blurb that tells you about the sutta. A lot of people say they don't know sutta, so you have to start here. The first thing is, you want to make friends, you've got to know the name of this friend, okay, so <laughs> what's the name of the sutta? The original name is simply Siha Sutta, Siha means lion, okay, but the many Siha Suttas in Pali, so I've added a, what is called a prefix to make it unique. Anicca Siha Sutta, so that at once you know it is number S22.78. Can you see the line below that? You can either remember the name or you remember the number. S22.78. S is Samyutta, Samyutta Nikaya. Samyutta means connected teachings. The translation in English the Lion Discourse on Impermanence. Now, EE means European Edition, Pali European. Pali Tech Society version is called Patama Siha Sutta. Patama means first and same, yeah? same meaning. And then you have the English translation, the first lion is passed. In other words, there are one or two others. And then the next line tells you the theme. In case someone asks you what this is Sutta about, the theme is how to meditate on the five aggregates. There you go. We study suttas not just to know suttas, more important than that. We want to know how to meditate better. Because all the suttas sooner or later point to meditation. Right? So that's why the suttas are important in that sense. Some suttas are easy, some are difficult, but if you spend a lot of time with the suttas, you find sooner or later there is this wonderful teaching on the nature of the mind, on meditation, and so on. So let's look at the sutta first, and I will explain in some details on time permits. Which 59. The lion discussed on impermanence as 22.78. Can you find the place, the location? Alright, verse 1. Originating in Sawati. So here the sutta compiler tells us where the sutta was given. Imagine that what you're looking at here is like a transcript of a talk. Let's say someone records the story and then it's, it's being recorded on a video and someone sits and then writes it down. And of course you have to edit it, you have to make, a, make sure the language is presentable, inspiring and so on. Right? So you find there is the narrator, the narrator will tell you where this thing happened, who are present, and then the Buddha speaks. Right? So the Buddha doesn't speak every word, but we know when the Buddha is talking or when uh, the teaching of the Buddha is put in such a way that it's spoken in the first person. Line 2 says, or verse 2 says, there, there the Blessed One addressed the monks and said this. Now whenever we see monks, it is obvious that the Buddha will address the monks because they are always present before him. But the monks represent people like us. It is through the monks that the Dharma, the teaching has come down to us. So whenever you see the word monks there, imagine yourself in the group. Okay? Now, I'm not just being nice here. In fact, in the Buddhist time, histor historically, this is the case. You have this beautiful park. It's a Jitavana. Okay? And uh, you have the monks sitting in front, one side. And then on the other side, you have the nuns. And behind the novices, and younger ones and nuns. And you have lay people nearby. Okay? Some lay people might be sitting behind. We're talking about this open space, you know, there's no uh, nice organization like you know, your nice chairs and so on. There are no chairs, I want sitting on the ground, you know, especially on a full moon day. You know, the full moon night, without, they may have firebrands burning, but basically it's the moonlight. And, and the night becomes very bright. We are so used to the bright city lights, we have lost the sense of the brightness of the moonlight, you know. So if you go into some retreat in some place where they switch off the light at say 9 p.m. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and there's only moonlight, you know, when you go to some retreat center in Australia, you begin to see the place is beautiful and bright in the moonlight. So imagine that's the kind of place the Buddha teaches the drama. That's why full moon days are a special 
significant, you know. Of course, new moon is no moon at all. And of course, you have to use these lamps, okay. So, the monks are sitting there, the nuns are sitting there, the laymen, the laywomen, they're all there. Everybody is listening. But the Buddha only says monks, because the monks are right in front, and the monks are the ones who are always there, and the monks are the ones who have been recording these teachings and handing down right to our time. And then the Buddha speaks, section 3. Now, first of all, look at the subheadings. This will give you an idea what you're going to study. First subheading, the parable of the lion. Okay, so the Buddha begins with something familiar, something that the Indians know about, something we're also familiar with. And then the second part is the Buddha's advent, the coming of the Buddha. And then the next page, we have another subheading, the Dharma's effect. And then the closing part is the verses on self-identity. So now you have an idea of overview of the Sutta. Section 3. The lion big shoes, big shoes are the man, in Chinese is teacher, just the okay? monks. You can find this here in the big dictionary. The lion big shoes, king of the beasts, in the evening emerges from his lair. Having emerged, he stretches himself, surveys the four quarters all around, roars his lion roar thrice, and then leaves for his hunting ground. Now this is familiar in the, among the ancient Indians. Of course, a reader in Singapore will probably hear of the lions and we are familiar with this kind of analogy. This lion has this, it's like, it's very regal animal, very royal, so it comes out and roars, very loud roar. Then what happens with the roar? Next section, big shoes. When the animals and creatures hear the roar of the lion, the king of the beast, they, for the most part, are struck with fear, urgency, and trembling. Those that live in holes enter their holes. The water dwellers head into the waters. The forest dwellers seek the forest. Winged beasts resort to the skies. So imagine you see one of those movies about Africa. You see the birds flying and was running because the lions are always very loud. And uh, I've heard the lions roar quite a number of times. You go to the zoo, you can hear. Five, big shoes. Those royal elephants bound by the stout bounds in the villages, market towns, and capitals, they break and burst their bonds and flee about in terror, voiding and peeing, because they are afraid they will be attacked. So this is fear. Big shoes, so greatly powerful is the lion, the king of the beasts, amongst the animals and creatures of great might and great majesty. Okay, this is the something the world is familiar with. So the Buddha begins with something worldly and is going to say something about the Dharma. Now, what is he going to talk about? So notice it's comparing, we can compare the Buddha to the lion. And the Buddha's teaching is sometimes called the lion roar. Because when you hear the Buddha's teaching, the effect can be different for different people. Let's find out what's the effect. This is the next part of the Sutta. 7. Even so, big shoes, when there arises in the world the Tathagata, Tathagata here is the Buddha, the worthy, fully self awakened, accomplished in knowledge and conduct, welfare, noble of worlds, fearless guide of persons to be guided, teacher of gods and humans, awakened blessed. These are the nine qualities of the Buddha that we have chanted this morning. Okay. He teaches the Dharma thus. This is form. This is the arising of form. This is the ending of form. Okay. So this is the first aggregate. You see, first the form is defined and say this is how it arises. And then this is how it passes away. Right. Rises and form. This is feeling. This is the arising of feeling. This is the ending of feeling. Okay. So again, okay, you see three aspects. The thing, the arising, perception. This is perception. This is the arising of perception. This is the ending of perception. 
these are formations, this is the arising of formations, this is the ending of formations. This is consciousness, this is the arising of consciousness, this is the ending of consciousness. Okay, what is the section trying to tell us? We can divide these five, notice form, feeling, perception, formation, consciousness. Form is our body. The rest, the other four, are aspects of our mind. So in simple terms, mind and body. First, we got to know what they are. I will talk about this in detail in a moment. Then, all these things, they are not fixed. Right? We don't say this body. It's not fixed thing. Even though you see your body, my body, everything is changing. Rising and ending. Rising, passing away. Rising, passing away. We breathe in, we have to breathe out. The heartbeat goes, look, 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 look. You cannot just say, look, 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 or look, 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 okay? So, there is this pattern, changing, changing all the time. That's how we live. So, this is how to word it, okay? So, this is when, if you understand the nature of impermanence and life, and you look at these sentences, wow, this is really beautiful. Now, this is the difference between whether you have wisdom, you, you have understanding or you have faith. You look at this, you see the beauty of it, the joy of it. So, if you don't have the faith, you don't have the wisdom, they are just words. They might be even very boring. So, that's the big difference. So, of course, these things don't just come like that. As you first you listen to the word level of the suttas, then you reflect and you begin to understand the meaning, it gets deeper. As you grow older, it gets deeper, you become wiser. Then the next time you hear it, even someone just say a line, you know, even a Sunday school young, Sunday school child, just chant a beautiful line, form is impermanent, you say, oh yeah, that's beautiful, right? This little child only reads the words without know, understanding it, but when you hear it, you say, wow, that's beautiful, because you understand the meaning. That's how Dharma works, right? So never uh, underestimate yourself. You say, oh, you know, I'm so new to this, I can understand the thing. We begin somewhere. Once you've begun, the next time, you start building up this wisdom. <laughs> then, the next section is on Dharma's effect, the state. We choose those devas, heavenly beings, long live, beauteous, great in joy, long dwelling in their divine mansions, hearing the Tathagata's Dharma teaching, for the most part are struck with fear, urgency, and trembling. Thus, okay, just stop away and look at this. This is why the lion roar is used. When the animals hear the lion roar, they are terrified. Fear of death and afraid the lion will attack to kill them. When the Buddha teaches the Dharma, everything is impermanent, even the devas are terrified. The divine beings. Why? Because the divine beings live with the idea that, oh, we, are, we last forever, right? because our lifespan is very long. They live so long, they think that they are living forever. But then the, the devas reflect in the next paragraph. It seems, sirs, we are but impermanent when we thought we were permanent. It seems, sirs, we are but unstable when we thought we were stable. It seems, sir, we are but ephemeral when we thought we were eternal. It seems, sir, that we are impermanent, unstable, ephemeral, all stuck in self-identity. Right? The idea that this body, I am this body, I am feeling, and so on. Okay? So, this is the Buddha reminding us that impermanence cut across all levels of being, even up to the heavens itself. In other religions, they say, oh, it's wonderful to go to heaven, and so on and so forth, but heaven is so impermanent. In other words, whatever exists must exist in time. Whatever exists, must be in heaven. If heaven exists, heaven also be in heaven. Nine. Victuals, so greatly powerful is the Tathagata of such great mind, such great majesty in the world with his devas. Okay? So the Buddha's word stops there. Then the narrator tells us, the Blessed One said this. Heaven said this, the teacher, the Sugata, the welfare, Further said this, 
Now the sutta closes with four verses. Yadi buddho abhinyaya dhamma chakkan bhavattayi sadeva prasa lokasa sata apatti bhukkalo So this is like the Mahabharata verse, a very nice line. When the Buddha, through direct knowledge, turned the wheel of truth, in this world with his devas, the teacher without a rival teaching, Sakayancha Nirodancha Sakayasa Cha Sangavan Ariyan Cha Tandikam Magyan Dukku Pasan Kamina The ending of self identity, the arising of self identity, and the noble path, the way to the stealing of suffering. Even the long-lived devas, beauties of great fame, are terrified, struck with trembling, just as the other beasts hearing the lion's roar, saying, At aviti vata sakayan anicca tira bhomayan Sutta Arahato Vakyam Vipamutta Sutta Dinoti. We have not overcome self identity. We are impermanent, so it seems they say, when they heard the word of the Arahat, the liberated one who is such. So this is put into the poem helps us remember teachings better. So this summary is like how to remember the teachings in the poem start. So you have the prose and the poem. So the sutta is very short, it ends there. So we have the five aggregates. Let me just briefly talk about the five aggregates. The Buddha begins with very simple questions. Okay, let's say we are very good to Buddhism. So, he probably will ask us, so okay, uh, if you look around, what do you think are the, the most the very basic things that we experience as living beings? What are we? What do we have? How do we know we exist? Let's ask a very simple question like that. How do I know I exist? This is one of those questions that have been asked for hundreds of years, thousands of years even, and it's the beginning of philosophy, beginning of religion, and so on. Okay, the first thing, what can we really know? What do we really know? Well. We know, I know, I have a body, right? Everybody agrees with that. We have a body. And that's form, okay? The first one, right? Yeah? First aggregate is form, the body. Then, I know I have a body. That knowing is the mind. Right? So we can't deny that you have a body, you have a mind. Okay? And then the Buddha goes on to analyze what is the body, what is the mind. If you analyze the body more into the detail, then you have what I call the five physical senses. I, ear, nose, tongue, body, the five senses. Or you can also analyze form the body in terms of the four elements. Now these four elements are not exactly the modern scientific idea of four or matter, although they are related, but that's not the biggest aim. The Buddha's aim is to remind us the nature of the body, unlike earth, water, fire, wind, meaning it's unstable, changing all the time. In fact, this idea is so uh, interesting, it became the foundation of traditional medicine, Indian medicine, Chinese medicine, and so on. Okay, this is a very, very basic idea, four elements. What is the earth element in our body? The solid parts of bone, the teeth, and so on. But, but even bone and teeth change, decay, especially as we age. Then water is liquid in our body, not just H2O, but any kind of liquid. Most of our body is liquid. Again, it's always in the flood. We drink water, we let it out. Right? So it's a cycle. Even our solid aspect is also a cycle. We take food and we void it. Then fire, fire warmth. Heat. It, can, uh, it also includes cold, temperature. Okay? This is 
the burning aspect, the oxidation, your breathing, your lungs, uh, taking the oxygen, you give out carbon dioxide and waste gas. And uh, it includes digestion, something to do with fire. It's just a name for decay. Our body decays, that's also fire element. And then you have wind. Wind is anything that moves, movement of the body. Wind comes in, air comes in, air goes up, we cannot stop those things, goes up ground. This also is the meaning of renunciation, but you're taking your to give back. So the wind element also includes, for example, what's called peristalsis in, in modern uh, medical language. When you take food, you swallow it and it brings it down, and then the opposite way goes out the other way. This also is wind element. So these four elements, they are unstable, they are all the time dynamic in our being. So our task to be, is to be healthy. To be healthy means the four elements are harmonized, okay? So that's the body. Six senses, or five senses, five physical senses, or four elements, or two ways of reflecting on the body. And then you have the, the mind. So there are many ways of talking about the mind. So when you use the, the five aggregates, we say the mind comprises feeling, perception, formation, consciousness. Okay? So, yeah, this uh, interesting this scholar, Alexander Wynn, in his paper on the Adagada Pramasutta, Adagada Pramasutta, he says that uh, the five elements, some people think that the sequence is wrong. They feel that the uh, consciousness should be put number two after form. Okay? Interesting notion, but I don't think that is really uh, uh, any problem. You know? Uh, in the sense that, I mean, consciousness is, is very basic, yes, but if the Buddha had put it in that sequence, if the Buddha put it in that sequence, obviously there's a good reason, right? I mean, he could have made a mistake as a group, so let me revise this. Huh? So, anyway, I've written a full reply there in section 5 of the Anubhita Pramasutta. So, today I'll show you why I feel that the five gates are listed quite naturally. First of all, we begin with the fact of a body form. We know that, which I already explained. Next thing, the Buddha is not interested in just the body. He says this is a body with consciousness. Sa vinyanaka kaya. A conscious body. A conscious body, in other words, has consciousness. A conscious body feels, right? When we see something, we feel. We hear something, we feel. In fact, in Pali, the word feel, pati, sangwe, deity, also means to know, to experience. Okay? So, in meditation language, in Buddhist language, to feel also means to know. To know also means to feel. And it's a very important, very useful uh, uh, distinction. Huh? When you only know by listening and you just listen to the words, you won't learn very much. Because you're only memorizing the words. With like third hand, fourth hand knowledge. But if you directly experience what the speaker is talking, which is not easy, you know, then you go deeper. Now this happens more uh, realistically in the arts. Music, for example. You listen to this beautiful sound. You can't think, you've got to listen to the sound. It's beautiful, high sound, low sound, soft sound, loud sound, and some people are so good with sounds that they, they can sort of remember the dimension of the sound in their mind. Then there are those who like colors and, and they see colors and they can tell you that the Italians are very good at this. They have so many names for just one kind of color. It's amazing, right? So those it's just yellow. They've got all kinds of, kinds of yellow, right? In other words, they are more aware of these various kinds of colors. Okay? So, uh, how did they do that? How did they able to have such sensitivity? Because they feel directly, they experience directly, directly what's going on. So what the lesson here is this, as Buddhists, this is how we look at people. We try to experience people through us. 
our mind directly by listening to them carefully, deeply, etc. That's called feeling, direct experience. People can say things, but how are they saying it? Uh, what is not said? Right? So these are things we have to notice with mindfulness. Right? Okay, so we're still talking about the body here, by the way. Right? So, because of the body, you feel, right? So number two is feeling. It makes sense, doesn't it? You have a body, you feel, right? The question now is, how do we feel? That's the next question we ask. How do we feel? For example, if the icon is off here and a lot of candles burning, you say, wow, it feels getting very warm. And if you don't like warm, you say, oh, I don't feel comfortable at all. But some people would like the warm, you know? so you have different reactions, because it's subjective, right? So because why? In the past, maybe they went to a warm room and now they had a memory they say, oh, I don't like this. Because why? They judge the present situation by a past memory. Okay? For example, you know, certain people don't like certain kinds of people. There's a very nice story here. There was this, uh, this is a true story, one of those kind of this story. You know? This young girl, she has this terrible fear of hairy arms. It terrifies her. She has a phobia. And nobody knows why. You know, phobia means an inordinate kind of fear. Very strange, very powerful, deep fear. So we went to see a psychiatrist, this very clever psychiatrist managed to find out what really caused this phobia in this girl who simply is terrified of hairy arms. Yeah, it seems that when she was very young, she went through an operation. She's supposed to be totally anesthetized, but she was still conscious. So she could see the doctor's hairy hand cutting her, you know. So she got terrified. And of course, as a young child, these are things you don't remember, but I mean, you don't talk about, but you you don't actually consciously remember them, but they're in the head. So that every time she sees hairy hands, this memory, the subconscious, like tell her, watch out, danger, you know. She doesn't know why. This is called on a subconscious level. Uh, latent tendency sometimes in in, in, uh, okay? in, in, in early Buddhist terminology. In other words, there are many kinds of things that trouble us. We don't know the reasons deep inside. But in meditation, you can go deeper and find out what it is. So anyway, coming back to feeling. So uh, when we see something and it reminds us of something nice, you know, there are people who see me. They say, "Hey, uh, you remind me of my uncle." No? Yeah, I said, I hope you like your uncle. <laughs> because you said, I hate my uncle, it would be terrible. <laughs> so you like to my uncle. I said, okay, I hope you love your uncle. Then the perception will be, ah, oh, he's a nice guy, but he looks like my uncle. You know? So that's the third one, perception. Perception. Perception means recognition. Recognition. It means you relate to something in the past. You know, we never look at people as they are, you know? we always compare to something in the past. So you say, oh, this looks like someone I like, okay, I like this guy. He looks like someone I don't like in the past, no, I also don't like. This is the first reaction. But if you are wise, you know all this is not true, not useful. But that's what happens normally, so to speak. Perception, we perceive things. That's what happens when you go shopping, it's all perception. They pack things nicely for you, loud music, bright lights, smiling uh, assistance, okay? You tell them I've got no money to pay and you find everything changes. <laughs> so the idea is to make you buy, okay? Perception. To, when you look at something, you say, wow, this must be good, you know, right? That's the whole idea. But always you read the fine prints, okay? So you have form, feeling, perception. Can you relate the three now? More or less, eh? Don't worry, if it is again in the future, other teachers will talk the same thing, but this is the for some of the beginning. Eh? Okay, form, feeling, perception. Okay, what do you do next? Let's say you go shopping, okay? You go to the supermarket or lots of stuff there. You notice when you go to the supermarket, you say, okay, I'm going to buy only these three things, you know? But you come back with a big bag look, right? You never buy just these three things, you always buy something else. But that's the purpose of making it in such a way you're going to buy lots of stuff. Okay? But anyway, what's the meaning of this? We look at something, we say it is very nice. Next thing you say, I want it. Ah, there you got to watch out. 
Because if you say I want it, what is making you say I want it? That's called greed. Alright? And you say something you don't like, you say I hate this. And then you get very angry, you have to do something like that. That's rooted in hate, the opposite. And then you see something you're not familiar with. A stranger, for example. You, you don't know what to do. We get bored. Especially in meditation, you know. Meditation, if something nice appears in your mind, you feel very happy. If something, especially you do loving kindness meditation, you think of something you don't like, you feel unhappy. But then a certain experience arises in you, there is this wonderful peace. Many beginners, they, they say, ah, this is boring time, everything the same. I say, that's peace. You smile at it, you feel very good. But the first time they don't know what it is. They didn't know it is peace. Because they never experienced it before. So if you have never experienced something before, you don't know how to connect with it. Okay? Then boredom arises. So liking, disliking, boredom. These three things can arise. So once these three, three things arise, then you come to the fourth aggregate. Formations. Sankara formation. Why are they called formations? You form karma because of that. If, let's say you see somebody looking very ugly and then you look and say, oh, this person looks very ugly and then after that, you must decide. If you say, may this person be well and happy, you're okay, good karma. But if you say, oh, this guy is so ugly, terrible, I hate this guy, bad karma, because hatred arises. So that's the point, you've got to decide what to do. This is why we come to that uh, Sadhisattva, Sankhu Tantra 4, to know how to respond to this kind of state, very quick, challenging situation. We don't want to be trapped in our own negative thoughts, negative karma. So this is the fourth aspect, Sankara, formation. You form negative ideas. That is why in meditation, your teacher will tell you, okay, nice states come, don't get attached. Negative states come, don't get attached. That's the easiest way. Don't get attached to it by reflecting they're all impermanent. Then you let go of them, you are safe. That's another way. The reflection on impermanent. I'm jumping here a bit, okay? So now come back to uh, Sankara. So once again, form, because we are form, we have a body, we are feeling. The feeling arises because of our perception. And as much as we perceive, we say it's impermanent, we are safe. But if you go beyond that, you say, I like this, I don't like this, or you get bored, then negative karma arises. Okay? And now the last one, number five, is consciousness. Consciousness. All these happen because there is consciousness. Consciousness is behind all this. So it makes sense. There are one, two, three, four, five, you see? I mean, it'd be harder to explain you put consciousness number two, you know? Right? The body and then consciousness. Well, I already mentioned the conscious body, but I got to mention consciousness again towards the end. Anyway, the five aggregates are like that since the very first discourse. Form, feeling, perception, formation, consciousness. All these are impermanent. If they are impermanent means you can never get full satisfaction from them. Just like your breath. What you take in, you must let it go out. You take in, you let it go out. I don't know what's the record for holding your breath. Five minutes, maybe longer. But you still must let it out if you want to live. You cannot you own nothing in this soul. Not even the air you breathe it. Not even the food you take. <laughs> Everything you take it, you must give back. Right? That's what you have. That is impermanence. It's very wonderful way of reflecting on impermanence. Okay? So, those are the five aggregates. Now, there are detailed descriptions here. If you would like to read, if you have to go on from where I've spoken, you can read from page 53 onwards. Eh? But I'm going to stop here. Just nice. So if you have any questions, this is the time to ask. Yes, you have 
smaller than four for the sample. Then yeah, five, five aggregates. Then how? What what is conscious? Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's the most difficult question. The scientists today are discussing, and nobody is in agreement. What is consciousness? Very difficult question. But the Buddha gives us some hints. Okay. Now, let us begin where we know. This this one problem is you got to begin where you know. But once you start bringing in things like our idea, we don't know. You see, so then you, you have problems there. So we got to ask ourselves, what do we know? As I said, we know we have the senses. We have five senses. In Buddhism, we say there is a sixth sense, which is the mind. They regard the mind also as a sense, because it's the mind that makes sense of everything, and the mind also creates all the experiences of the other five senses. The mind can create its own vision, its own sound, and so on, like in dreams. You know? So, uh, consciousness is when the eye meets the visual object. So you have internal sense, internal sense faculty, external sense object. Okay, I object. The third point is consciousness. I object consciousness. Then there is feeling. This is how the Buddha explained what actually happens. From this kind of explanation, we can go a little further. We can say, okay. Consciousness is our reaction to the world through the senses. How we experience the world through the senses, through the senses. Okay. Now, then there are certain questions we can ask, but the question becomes meaningless. For example, where does consciousness begin? It's something the Buddha said. The question is wrongly put. We have this very important concept of Buddhism. The question must be asked correctly. Right? For example, some question got made no sense at all. Questions like, when did time begin? Grammatically correct, but it doesn't make sense because whatever happened must happen in time. When did ignorance begin? Again, wrongly put, because ignorance is a mental state. So the Buddha answer says, whatever that can happen. Happens because of conditions. Remember this very important word in Buddhism, in Buddhism: conditions. Nothing happens for only one reason. No such thing. There are always many conditions, and this teaching is very important for us. So, if anything goes wrong, we don't blame anybody. Not one person, not even ourselves. We look for the conditions that brought this problem to happen. Okay. So same thing with consciousness. Consciousness occurs when there are right conditions. You have the eye, and the eye of course is part of the body, not just the eye by itself. In Buddhism, there are two words for eye. The eye by itself, or the eyeball, is called aki. The Buddha doesn't talk much about that because not much use there. The Buddha used the word chaku, chakshu, which is this eye, the eye which is connected to your whole body, the functioning eye. This eye is conscious, sees objects out there. So your eye object consciousness. There's a triangle of experience, and then you're experiencing something. That's consciousness. Then we are also conscious of past events, memory. We can project ahead also. So this is all the way the mind works. So in a sense, uh, consciousness also must evolve. It doesn't. You're not born with it. In fact, you can see this happening in the baby. The little baby is born. The consciousness is almost zero. It's the beginning. Only. So we get toys. We play music with the child. We talk to the child. We make funny sounds because we want the child to develop his or her consciousness through all the six senses. But for the child, we can only help basically the first five senses because the child is still very small. So we put colorful pictures to, uh, what should I say, trigger the way the child sees things. The consciousness on the eye level, and then we have 
Tigers make sound, you know, they just tell, oh, that certain sound. And of course, smell. You know, ch 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 babies don't really like mother smell. You know? Somehow they don't like father smell so much. <laughs> They're more used to the mother smell. Okay? Maybe usually close to the mother more. And then, uh, taste, of course, food, yeah? taking milk and so on. And so, uh, feeling, you hug the child, the little baby, the baby that is hug a lot, grows up to be very healthy. So all the five senses, this is what the parents are doing. The parents are helping this child develop cognit cognitively. Cognitive is, uh, is the adjective for consciousness. Okay? Cognitive uh, development. Right? And then the child starts talking, reading, then you, you go on to the mental development. So all these are different six kinds of consciousnesses. Right? So that's one way of looking at consciousness. You can say consciousness is how we think, but it's also how we feel. Remember, feeling in Buddhist psychology means direct experience. Okay? Anyway, this, as I said, this is a very big subject. I've written a whole long essay on this. If you want to read an essay, just email me and we'll send it to you. Okay? Then you, can, you can't sleep with that. It helps you to sleep, and then the last thing you remember very well also where you stop. And every night just read the bed, you know. So it's a double benefit, double blessing. <laughs> it's not, I normally put beside my bed, so this does not go such a very boring to read, but I must read. <laughs> okay? It's a big question. Even the scientists are very interested about what's the answer, and they are still, you know, discovering this. Any other questions? <clears throat> Distinguishing perception and consciousness. Ah, yes, quite, quite tricky. Perception and consciousness. Perception, we say, perception, consciousness cognizes. The eye sees, uh, say, color, uh, lights, you know, shapes, yeah. cognize. The perception recognizes. Consciousness cognizes. Perception recognizes. So now you see the word recognize, it's got a new meaning. Cognize again. So in other words, consciousness is the most basic experience. For example, if you have never come here before, you don't know where this temple is. You say, I'm going to go there. And you, as you drive along, you're picking up all the information. Okay, this tree, that building, this name, that road. And then, then you come and you turn in here, then you, have this, you are recording many, many uh, bits of information. So that's your cognition. Cognition also means knowing another simple level. Then later when you come back, you recognize this place. Yeah, so that's perception. Okay? So perception is a high level of consciousness. In a sense. Yeah, in a sense. So when you experience something, then it's sort of recorded in your mind, and next time you respond to it, that's perception. So if you never had that kind of consciousness, you, you would not have perception. Okay? So we want to get rid of hatred, for example, so that we would not uh, perceive hatred again in the future. So this is the one, uh, deeper meditation training. In fact, uh, volume 17 of the Sutta Discovery, all the five aggregates are explained in detail in two volumes, by the way. This is one volume, it's a level volume. Yeah? So it's a very big subject, very important subject. The psychologists love that. Okay, anything else? Can I go memory before the session? Memory would be under consciousness. Memory is more, more like everything yeah. acting together. Okay? Yeah. What is it? She is. Oh, yeah? Okay. <laughs> Very wise. Perceive is it memory? Sorry? Perceive. Perceive? No, I think uh, it, it covers everything. Because the Pali one is Sati, mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Okay? So here you can we go a little deeper there. Memory, you must have mindfulness. When you do something, you feel it, you are present, you say, this is it. Then you remember it. Okay? That's why the psychologists are very interested in meditation. It helps to improve your memory. Mindfulness. Okay? So memory is the working of all this uh, the mental aspect. Especially uh, mindfulness aspect. In other words, 
all the, the mind at their best working together. Okay? We recited the Sutta just now. Okay? So that's, we are trying to remember it. You know, the monks, when I was a monk, when we get a new rope, we take the corner of the rope, we use some kind of, usually I use a pen, you can use anything, to mark a dot there. It's called a bindu kappa. You make a dot there. Actually, the dot is to deface the rope. Because it's a nice new rope, you know, so you take this, let a black dot there, sort of to make it ugly, you know. But in a sense, uh, when you reflect on the rope, even this, this rope I wear not to beautify myself, just to protect myself, look, make myself look decent, so that I can practice the Dharma. Okay? So the, the dot is put there to remind you, we remind ourselves, as a man we say, okay, and this rope is just this one, it is, it is a symbol of renunciation. So every time we do that, we remember our situation. Others we forget, you know. Right? That's why the monks shed their hair or something. Right? So that they look different from others. And you go into a shopping center, you stand up like a monk. <laughs> you can actually see, oh, it's not supposed to be there. You know? So this, these are all reminders so that the monk remember he has renounced the world. So as lay people, it's a bit more difficult because we don't have the kind of reminder. Our reminders are invisible. So you come here on Sunday, you listen to the Sutta, Sutta so say impermanent, impermanent. So we've got to listen to this again and again so that the next time something bad happens, we say impermanent. Whatever happens, impermanent. That's the best mantra. Impermanent. You find it works every time. Something bad happens, you say impermanent. And you don't feel so bad because it will pass. Something could happen, it is impermanent. You may, you may want it to go on, but it's impermanent. Then, when, then you, you really enjoy it. When it goes away, it's gone. Same thing with people, you know, no matter how much you love the person, the person cannot always be with you. Not very good, because if you love too much, you get attached, next time become Siamese twins, it's terrible, you know? I mean, not really helpful, isn't it, Siamese twins, you know? Right? You've got no separate life for you. What I want to explain here is that there must also be space with someone you love, right? And when, if you know this person you love also is impermanent in two ways, one is you cannot be with this person all the time, Secondly, there comes a time when we both have to go away, right? then you value this person even more. Right? Even with children, you know? I mean, we love this little kid we have, and then the kid grows up, become a teenager, and after that, they're on their own, you know? So you can't own them anymore, right? So when you reflect on impermanence, in a sense, it's a reality check. And you, you value things which are important to you even more so through impermanence. Okay? Alright. So perception is not memory. It's part of memory. Because when you perceive something, it's based on memory. You, know? you remember something and you say, oh, I know this person. Or I, I see, I remember, I like this thing because of something happy in the past. So it's connected with memory. So memory is like a functioning of the whole mind. Okay? Sati is sometimes considered as memory also, mindfulness. Function of mindfulness. In those, those days, in you know, ancient times, the monks, they don't have books like this, everything they have to memorize. Mm. And they have less instruction. And nowadays, the monks have got a handful of the Taputa side, so they use their brain less. <laughs> but this time, Ananda is eidetic memory. Right? You hear something and remember, and you can chant very fast also. I speak. Mm. Any other questions? We have about 15 minutes more and ask a bit few more questions if you like. Anything you're not sure about? So remember when we study sutras, first time maybe it might like, sound a bit difficult, look a bit difficult, it's okay. Because the message is there. And then you find when you read it another time, after listening to Dharma talk, especially when you do meditation also, you go back to the sutta, you find it's easier to understand, especially people who have done meditation. You know, I've been reading many of these suttas since I was a middle-aged teenager, you know, about 15, 16 years old. So I've been wanting, looking for this kind of sutta, and here it is right before me. And if you look at the last page of the sutta, page 61, 
Now you can see there are three dates there, right? 1302, 28. Uh, 13 is 2013. Uh. That means it begins with uh, in that year. And then the latest change is 2014. Eh? And now after I go back, I'll be updating it again, so 2016. Mm -hmm. Now some of them have a whole st string of dates, you know. So every year at least one, so I get this. So this is where, in other words, uh, the suttas must be, it's like music, you listen to them again and again. And each time you listen, something new comes to you. Okay? You, you begin to understand yourself better. When you understand your, yourself better, you understand everything around you better. Still. Okay. much more than that. Uh, okay, first of all, Abhidharma uh, is an effort to systematize the teachings after the Buddha has passed away. They try to be a bit more what we say today, scientific, I think, to more uh, methodical and so on. So, uh, if you, it's very important to know Sutta first, because Abhidharma talks about Sutta. Sometimes Abhidharma explains Sutta more clearly, but sometimes Abhidharma, they have their own idea. The early suttas are basically the foundation of all the Buddhist schools, if they call themselves Buddhist. But the Abhidharma of the different schools, they're very different. So you've got Theravada Abhidharma, and then you've got uh, uh, Savastivada Abhidharma, but the Savastivada school no more around. Right? So in other words, you have all these ancient schools, they all have their Abhidharma, because that one is how they systematize the suttas. So the, it is a later development. Uh, I don't know how they measure all this timing, maybe through deep meditation, but the, the fact that they disagree means it is their opinion. So it depends on which school you listen to, they, they will describe the nature of consciousness in different ways, the number of thought moments, you know, so it depends which school you listen to. So don't be surprised if you suddenly hear that it just is something else. Don't be confused, just different school we are thinking, you know. Uh, but when you go back to the sutta, you find everybody have to talk the same thing. But this is the oldest, you go back right to the roots. Right? So here the Buddha is not talking about thought moments. Okay, we talk about five aggregates, right? Now, the one problem with the scholar is he thinks the five aggregates are a sequence. You start with body and then feeling. When I explain it, yes, it appears to be in sequence, but the reality is when you see me, all the five gates are happening at the same time. It's not a sequence. It's happening at the same time. Just like the atom, you know. You see a picture of the atom in, in, on the computer or in your science book. There's no such thing. The atom is moving all the time. But this picture is just to show you so that you know the parts. Same thing with the five gates. The five gates are changing all the time. But the five gate is just to give us an idea, free spread, free spread, give us an idea, okay, body, consciousness, and so on and so forth. But it's happening at the same time. You, the Buddha look at it and give five terms, so you can understand how this thing functions. You can also use the 12 links to understand experience. That's another way of looking at it. So they are not a sequence. So, Although I say, okay, uh, you do this, you see form and the feeling and the perception, and then comes the karma part, right? That is to help us be more mindful when we experience daily life, okay? But it's not really a sequence. But the way we act is the sequence. But what's happening is like electricity also. Everything goes zap, you know? But then when you study electricity, they talk about power amperes, talk about volts, and and wattage and so on, right? Yeah, but the stick is because that, like that, is it? So five get or so like that. Okay. Okay, a few more minutes. Anything you're not sure about? <laughs> Can you comment on the 
This is the essence of it. In other words, uh, if you're not sitting in meditation in daily life, how do you deal with the world? Okay, this is the Buddha's advice. You know, the Buddha taught this verse to Bahia and to Malankya Buddha, these two people, and they became arahats because of that. So their mind is very developed. But for us, we can use this as reflection. Whatever you see here or any of your senses, this is your experience. Okay, look at the verse, page 58. Have you found it? Yeah. Here, here that means in this world, in your experience, regarding things seen, heard, sensed, and cognized or known by you. So in other words, whatever experience you experience, all the six senses, right? In the seeing, there will be only the seeing. In the herd, there will only be the herd. In the sense, there will only be the sense. In the cognize, there will only be the cognize. The last one you can trust is in the known, there will only be the known, also can. Now, number four, sense. Okay, sense here covers three senses. Eh? Uh, hear, touch, and smell. Combine eh? in the three sense. Okay, look at number one. In the scene, there is only the scene. Especially in meditation. Now, when you when you're meditating, let me tell you a funny story first. Okay, I'll just tell this to my meditation class. We were meditating in the camp, uh, one of those jungles in Malaysia once. Oh, go away. And I got this group of young people. Okay, well, I love this jungle. Probably Cameron Islands, I think. Well, it's in the forest anyway. So they were sitting down meditating. So I told them, close your eyes and meditate. Okay, you're not used to closing your eyes, you open your eyes. So there was one kid who opened his eyes. So he was sitting down, looking down. Because if you're meditating, you open your eyes, you look down, see, right? So then you don't get distracted. Remember, these are city boys, town boys, never been to the jungle before. So sitting down, meditating. And then, after that, this big giant hand was walking by. It is big then his boy's eyes became bigger and said, wow, what a huge tent. <laughs> and he just got surprised and he got distracted. And he says, what a giant man. He's never seen a giant man before. He got distracted, you see. So I told him, I said, aha, you forgot the distraction, you see. There is no end there. It's just seeing, you know, seeing, seeing. Of course, you can remember a giant end and then leave it at that. You say, see, then you won't get distracted. But because he was you never see the big end before, you got so excited, they get got distracted. Okay? So, whatever you see, you just say seeing. That is just the action of seeing. That means you objectify it. Objectify. Subjectify means you say, I like it, I don't like it. Subjectify. Objectify means you just say seeing. You don't say, I like, I don't like. Or I don't care. You don't say that. That's the meaning here. That is just seeing. Yes. Just letting go. Yes, that's another thing. Letting go probably is a little harder, but yeah, you can say that. So there's just seeing, okay? Sight, you could have. Same thing, sound, okay? Someone says something not nice, you just say sound, sound. Okay? And you find if you say sound, you don't get affected by it. Not so much, you don't, you don't worry about it. Of course, the problem with sound is, is more difficult because we process the meaning, you know? You hear this like, person talking things, sound language are very rough and so on, so you, can, you also get affected. If you're not trained, it's not easy. So you have to go to another level, you've got to use loving kindness. Someone is quarreling, you say, oh, okay, sound, 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 but still doesn't work. Okay? Then you say, well, this person obviously is not happy. That's why he's so angry, saying all these words. And then compassion arises in you, you say, this person is not happy, that's why he's saying all these unhappy words. If it's happy, you say nice words. So you begin to use your wisdom to cut down on this negative feedback. Right? 
Smell, not too difficult. You know, I often take a train and we come at the wrong time, especially peak time. You know, people go home, I go to work, see? So I have to take a train and I go in opposite direction. When, when I get down at Raffles Place, wow, this crowd is coming towards me. <laughs> so I have to go to the side. <laughs> Quite frightening, you know. But when you have the train, the crowd is one thing. Next thing you stand around people, the smell is very strong. Right? And you have to be right in front of you while you got to meditate. <laughs> so you say smell, smell. But the smell is still there, you know. Okay? So you go on to another level, loving kindness. You say, okay, this person smells very strong. Obviously has worked very hard. It's the end of the day, right? So you feel compassion for this person who has worked so hard. And that's proof of it. <laughs> so you don't have to like, you don't have to hate it. Okay? I mean, if it's your own child, you, you don't mind, you see, right? So that's how we use loving kindness. We regard others like family, something like that. Then you find the lots of positive emotion. You're very happy. Right? If you meet the Buddha, the Buddha will accept you just as you are. So we also should accept others in that way, so to speak. Okay? Okay. Four more minutes. I remember in one of my courses, the first time nobody asked questions. No, I said four more minutes, everybody starts asking questions. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think it's very interesting when you talk about the ant. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, yeah? When you talk about the The giant ant, okay. Uh, because, I mean, obviously, if you meditate yeah. and then you see here it's a big ant, yeah. then you, you will start to think. <laughs> Did they come to you? Oh, okay. Did they bite you? Yeah. <laughs> what, what should I do? Yeah. Should I move away? <laughs> so, so how could you have that compassion mm -hmm. to say, okay, I won't be bothered with yeah. you, yeah. and yeah, please don't bother about yeah. me? Yeah. And yeah. Would no, they react? No, the forest the monks are very good at teaching all this. Because they'll tell you, before you start meditating, you make sure the place is just right, so you won't have to deal too much with all this distraction. But it's okay, I mean, that's why we also teach loving kindness, especially if you're meditating in the forest. You've got to show loving kindness to all the beings there. So it's okay, if you sit quietly, normally the ants won't come to bother you. But if you really fear ants, that's another story. Then we use camping skill. You just put a bit of sulfur all around you, then the ant will come into the circle. The end will avoid it. Yeah, that's one way. Uh, but there was one very beautiful experience we had in, in the National Park, Taman Negara in Malaysia. Uh, you know, we all, in the jungle, we sweat a lot because we warm, the weather is very hot. And when you sit, especially near the water, there are this giant bird wing, with green color. It's, it's a rare butterfly here, but it's quite common in the jungle. You find the swarm of this butterfly settling here on your nose, on the shoulder, and it, we can take a very nice picture of that. So this butterfly actually is sitting on you right now. Okay? Then there's one more experience I have in the same jungle. You see, because the, the what they call the headquarters, you have this, uh, some bushes there with plants, and they got two deer. You know, this deer somehow keep coming to the that place, probably because people give food, you know. So the steer keeps coming. And so we were, but it will never come near you. Because they are deer, although they, they will come, you can see them within sight and they, 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 they are not afraid of human beings because they are used to humans already. But they won't come near you. So we were sitting down in the open air, meditating in the, on the grass, we were sitting down. And then, the, there was this very shy girl sitting right at the edge of the car. Right? And then this deer came near her and started licking her slurp. <laughs> she was so terrified she didn't move. She closed her eyes even more. <laughs> yeah, I was almost laughing after that meditation. I said, well, that's wonderful, you know. So you must be doing loving kindness, you know, right? So this deer kind of like her. But there is the, a the simpler scientific explanation. <laughs> she was sweating. Ah, she was sweating. Salt. The deer wants the salt. <laughs> so, salt lick. That's called a salt lick. Normally, a salt lick is actually on the ground. You know, they, 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 these animals will kind of scrap the ground, 
it's got salt and you know, lick the salt for it. Too. So this girl happened to be licked also by the deer. So these are meditation experiences we had in the jungle. <laughs> so you just sit there quietly, these animals won't harm you. I mean, imagine the Buddha in the jungle. Lots of these wild animals come to him, you know. And there are all kinds of stories. There was this very intelligent elephant that even took care of the Buddha. Boiled water for him, very interesting. You know the story about the elephant boiled water? The elephant was watching the Buddha all by himself. So, he followed what the Buddha did. So, elephants are very intelligent. So, he took two sticks, followed the stick the Buddha used. So, one he put on a step down with his foot, and he used his trunk and start rubbing to get fire. Two sticks, the fire stick. And then when you got the fire, then you push more of the brush of those dry plants up there. And then the fire is formed. And then you roll round rocks into the fire. So the fire heats up the rocks. In the meantime, while the rocks have been heated, he goes and fetch some water because you got to you're used to the water, but he uses his nozzle to suck the water in. And then he puts the water into this little depression in the rock. Puts the water in there. And then he rolls the rock with a stick. It's too hot, you see? So he uses a stick with a nozzle and then trunk, you know? So he rolls the rock into the water. Then the water becomes warm because of the rock. And then he goes to the Buddha and, and pulls the Buddha's rope corner, telling him, hot water is ready. <laughs> so that's how the elephant fell hot water with the Buddha. One of those very famous stories of the Buddha spending his retreat in, in the Padilaya forest, all by himself. And then there's sort of this monkey came along. Monkey also was watching. And the monkey thought, what could he do? He couldn't do all those things. So he bought some ripe bananas and gave to the Buddha. He was watching whether the Buddha would eat it or not. Then the Buddha took it. He was so happy. Being a monkey, so happy, overjoyed. He jumped from tree to tree. He missed a branch and he fell. And then there was this sharp sting. He died right away. But he had a happy thought, you see. So he was reborn immediately as a deva. So the story goes. Even the elephant, when the elephant died, he was reborn as a divine being also. In fact, some people say this elephant, the, the ties, they turn into a shrine. So the elephant that was born, you know, is the same elephant. But we don't worship the elephant, but the ties like to worship everything. So they worship the elephant. So the elephant is called Yeraman. Yeraman is uh, one of those elephants in the heaven of the 33. So those are stories, no? animals. There are lots of beautiful animal stories. Okay, that's nice. And I'm here for today. No more questions, huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a Dhammapada commentary. Dhammapada commentary. The stories behind the Dhammapada verses. Okay. Okay, now we do a short reflection to close our study. The Dharma is always there, waiting for us. The Dharma is always present, but we must find time plan our lives in such a way that there's always time for spiritual development. Even if we don't come to temple, we can study the suttas at home, the suttas are available to the internet, through books and so on, or through our own reflection. As long as we reflect on the suttas, the meaning of the teachings, we are communicating directly with the Buddha. And when we do that, we feel at peace. And when there is peace, the mind becomes clear. And when the mind is clear, wisdom arises. We can see things as they are now clear. So it is a very simple experience, but we must have patience and diligence. And this is how we grow spiritually. Happening. Reflecting in this way is wonderful good karma. But the power of such karma may all beings here be well and happy. May those who have been kind to us, helping us in different ways, those who have taught us the Dharma, may they be well and happy. By the power of the Triple Ten, all the good deeds you have done, may we send our loving kindness to all our loved ones, our friends and relatives, people we know. May they be well and happy. And also those whom the Dharma have not touched, those who still do not know the Dharma, may they see the Dharma in this life itself. May all beings 
be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.